It's the 20th of January, 1649, and it's a trial unlike any other in the history of England. Charles I is being tried for treason, and Oliver Cromwell and his men have handpicked 68 judges. Now, the king is defiant. He refuses to believe that a monarch can actually be tried by his subjects, and he demands to know by what authority they're doing this. Charles believes, you see, in the divine right of kings, a long-standing idea that kings receive their authority directly from God. To Charles' way of thinking, a rebellion against the crown, well, that's a rebellion against heaven itself. To suggest that a king might be guilty of treason seems ludicrous to him because, well, the very definition of treason is to betray the nation, and the king is the embodiment of the nation. So whatever Charles wants, well, that's ordained by God. So he insists that he will only answer to the charge of treason if the court can prove they have the right to try him. And at one point, he reaches out and pokes a court official with his cane, and the top of the cane falls off. Now, never in his life has Charles ever had to pick something off the floor because, well, that's what servants are for. But on this day, nobody moves. And that's when Charles realizes he is no longer a king, but a mere man. And the object resting on the floor is a dark omen of what's going to happen next. On the 25th of January, Charles is convicted and sentenced to death by beheading. He was executed right here, outside the banqueting house in Westminster. Now, there was nothing special about the executioner. The people who were here tell us his head came off with a single blow, which means that the sentence was carried out by an executioner who had performed an awful lot of them on mere commoners. The severed head was hoisted high above the crowd, the executioner shouting, behold, the head of a traitor. Now, it's not the kind of story most people would read their kids at bedtime, but it is one of the most important moments in European history. Another one of the threads we have to pick up if we're going to understand how America was born. At that moment, when the common people tried and executed a king, a new idea was taking root very quickly. The universal rule of law, where even a monarch had to obey, it was, of course, kind of a violent way to make a point, and Cromwell did make a lot of mistakes after that, including, well, just dismissing Parliament when he didn't like their opinion. But the point had been made. The tide was turning in Europe, and people were starting to question absolutely everything, including a thousand years of social organization. And the most thoughtful, the most influential of these people started to move away from swords and spears, and instead, they adopted the power of the pen. The Church of England, of course, was founded on a sticky personal problem that Henry VIII had. He wanted an heir, and his wife was barren, so he wanted an annulment. The Pope wouldn't give him one. Then he noticed that a lot of the German princes were shaking off the authority of the Pope, and he thought, you know what, I could do that too. I could become the head of a new independent church. Now, when England formally broke with Rome, the hopes of a lot of people probably started running high because, hey, maybe like some of the people over on the continent, they could finally be free to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. Maybe they could be free to answer directly to God and not through a state-prescribed religion. That's not at all what happened. By the 1600s, people began to realize that they had exchanged one form of religious tyranny for another. The new Church of England was not just one more religious option, it became compulsory. By 1593, there was a law known as the Conventicle Act forbidding any religious gathering of more than five people outside of an officially sanctioned parish church. So essentially, a home church could land you in jail. After the English monarchy was restored in 1660, they passed another law, the Act of Uniformity, which said that all clergy had to be ordained by the Anglican bishop, and all church services had to be conducted according to the Book of Common Prayer. There was no room for creativity and no room 
for differences of opinion. So the 1600s proved to be anything but a time of religious liberty. In fact, in some ways, things might have even gotten worse. You had all these groups popping up, people known as nonconformists, and they're just the people who want to worship God the way their own conscience told them to. People like the Barrowists, who believed you didn't need the sanction of the state to worship God however you wanted. People like the Fifth Monarchists, who had studied the four kingdoms of Daniel and decided the next world empire was going to be the kingdom of Christ. And people like the Levelers and the Puritans and the Quakers and the Sabbath Keepers, none of them were allowed to worship freely. Most people have heard of John Bunyan, the man who wrote that great classic, Pilgrim's Progress. What some people don't realize is that he wrote it while sitting in prison for his faith. In 1661, he was convicted of breaking the Conventicle Act, which forbid worshiping or preaching in private. So what they did with Bunyan is said, look, if you agree to stop preaching, you'll just spend three months in prison. Otherwise, you're gonna have to stay here. Bunyan chose to stay. His faith was that important to him. He was in the Bedford County Jail for 12 years. So when a lot of people realized that they were never going to be free, some of them took up arms to change the country, like Oliver Cromwell. But some of them decided to leave, and they came here to the Netherlands, which was the freest republic in Western Europe at the time. Here, people with different religious opinions somehow managed to live side by side without killing each other. They were experimenting with a novel concept, religious liberty, and it was working. The Dutch were really onto something, and they found themselves taking all sorts of religious refugees. During the 1600s, this was the place to be. The nonconformists, or dissenters as they were sometimes called, were coming here from England. The Huguenots were fleeing religious persecution in France. And maybe most importantly, the Jews were coming from Spain to get away from the wrath of the Inquisition. Now let's take a bird's eye view of this for a moment, because this is one of the most important moments in the birth of America. These dissenters coming from England were Protestant, and they believed that the best model for the Christian life was found not in canon law or in long-held tradition, but in the pages of the Bible. Most of the educated dissenters could read Latin because that was the current language of learning. But very few of them could read the Bible in the original languages. So here in the Netherlands, there was this entire Jewish community who could teach them. Suddenly, they were reading the Old Testament in Hebrew, and they had access to some very old commentaries. And in the midst of their studies, they stumbled into that story we looked at last time about Israel asking Samuel for a king. The dissenters' jaws were on the floor. Was it possible that this was the reason they were still having trouble with human kings to this day? And was it possible, if they had already thrown off the political shackles of a powerful bishop, that they could also dispense with having a king? This became one of the biggest debates of the 17th century. What could you do if you had a nation that didn't have a king? I mean, clearly, God had been angry when Israel asked for a monarch, and the world had been struggling under human empires ever since. So what if the dissenters reversed that decision? What if they created a new situation where people could be directly answerable to God the way they had been prior to the incident with Samuel? Now, I know this likely did not come up in your history classes in high school, but do not underestimate how important this was. Here were people who dreamed of a new republic that didn't have a king. To you and me, that just seems like old news. But in the 1600s, that was revolutionary. And I use the word revolutionary quite deliberately. The very ancient Israelites these people discovered lived in a republic instead of a monarchy. And when you go back and read their deliberations, you'll find some of them referring to the government of Israel as the Hebrew Republic. And then they dug even deeper, and they stumbled onto Deuteronomy 17, where God actually predicted that Israel was one day going to ask for a king. And in that event, 
If that's what they insisted on, God provided some very strict guidelines, a safety rail, if you will, to prevent things from getting out of control. Now, this is a passage that does bear reading at length because what we find here are some of the key concepts that gave birth to the American Republic. I'll start reading in verse 14. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. In other words, they were supposed to follow God's guidelines. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So the king had to be native born. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. In other words, the king would not be permitted to return his people to bondage, even if he thought it meant prosperity. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. So there were checks and balances, if you will, in an effort to stem corruption. Now comes the most important part, verse 18. Also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So we had the absolute rule of law, a nation where the king had to live by the same laws as his subjects. Now, this passage sparked a great deal of controversy because it raised some important questions. Had God actually wanted a king for Israel? Or was a king just plan B in case everything went haywire? D did the existence of a king make God angry? Or was a king God's plan all along? One thing was clear. If we're going to have to live with human government, there are some forms of government that are much better than others. And this was one of those. So what we have in the 17th century is a broad group of diligent Bible scholars who become absolutely convinced that what the Israelites had in the very beginning was a republic. And these ideas that the top executive should be native born, that you had to prevent corruption and that everybody should live by the very same law, including the top executive. Well, oddly enough, those same ideas made their way into the American Constitution because the founders of the American Republic were students themselves and they had been reading the works of the English dissenters. They'd read John Locke, who'd been forced to hide in the Netherlands when he was accused of plotting to kill the king. Today, Locke is widely regarded as one of the architects of our liberty. And while hiding in the Netherlands, he wrote a letter concerning toleration, which made powerful arguments suggesting that the proper sphere of government was civil matters and the proper sphere of the church, spiritual matters. The only business of the church is the salvation of souls, and it no way concerns the commonwealth, or any member of it, that this or the other ceremony be there made use of. Neither the use nor the omission of any ceremonies in those religious assemblies does either advantage or prejudice the life, liberty, or estate of any man. The Founding Fathers had also read the works of John Milton, the famous poet, who argued for the rule of law and the consent of the governed. It follows lastly that since the king or magistrate holds his authority of the people, both originally and naturally for their good in the first place, and not his own, then may the people, as oft as they shall judge it for the best, either choose him or reject him, retain him or depose him, though no tyrant, merely by the liberty and right of free-born men to be governed as seems best. These were powerful ideas, and today we find those same ideas in the American Constitution. It was an idea whose time had come.
some of these ideas also made their way on board the famous Mayflower, a ship that carried Puritans to the New World. Puritans who had been hiding here in the city of Leiden in the Netherlands, like many others were. Today we call them the Pilgrims, a name that captures the essence of who they were, deeply religious people looking for something better from the hand of God. Here in the Netherlands, they found religious liberty, the freedom to worship. But over time, they became concerned that their children were growing up more Dutch than English. And because the Netherlands were an important center of world commerce at the time, they were also worried that their children might become rather worldly. So they decided to do what so many others have done ever since, get a new start in a brand new world. Now, what they intended to do was settle in a relatively established area near the mouth of the Hudson River. But the wind mysteriously blew them off course and they ended up here in Plymouth, an area that had already been somewhat developed by the Patuxet Indians. But the Patuxets had been wiped out by a devastating plague before they arrived, and the few remaining survivors had already left. So the pilgrims found an agreeable piece of land that had already been cleared. And more importantly, they found stores of corn that had been buried in the ground. And that was enough to help them survive their first brutal winter in the New World. It's really an incredible story. So incredible, in fact, that the pilgrims themselves became convinced, like Columbus, that God had sent them here. There were just too many coincidences to believe anything else. Take, for example, the story of Squanto. Now, his real name was Tisquantum, but apparently they found that too hard to pronounce, so they shortened it to Squanto. It turns out that Squanto had been kidnapped, not once, but twice by Englishmen who had taken him captive to Europe. He was eventually liberated by some Spanish monks and made his way back to the New World, only to find out that his people had been wiped out by plague. It was a horrible series of events that was perpetrated by some really bad people. But like Joseph of the Bible, who was sold into slavery and ended up saving God's people, Squanto ended up saving the pilgrims. Not only did they discover a local resident who happened to speak English, but they also found a man who could teach them how to survive in their new home. From Squanto, they learned how to raise corn and mine the riches of the local rivers for food and they also negotiated peace with the Wampanoag tribe, a peace that lasted 50 years. Now, here's the interesting part of this story. Because of his time in Europe and because of his time with the Spanish monks who liberated him, Squanto had already been exposed to Christianity, and he'd adopted some of it. But his ideas were Catholic, and the pilgrims were rather staunch Protestants. In some parts of the Old World, this might have been a problem, but the pilgrims had already been living in the Netherlands, where religious toleration was popular. And now they were building a new existence in the New World, where eventually the various sects of Christianity would be able to coexist peacefully. Not that the pilgrims always got it right, because in the beginning, they were really only interested in religious liberty for themselves. Turns out that centuries-old religious habits can be very hard to shake, and we have some horrible examples of religious intolerance that took place in decidedly Puritan communities. As other Puritans joined these brave souls who'd come on the Mayflower, Plymouth was eventually overshadowed by the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a place they all hoped would become a shining example of good Puritan government. But in spite of the grief that they'd experienced in the old world, it was still a theocracy, a new state that still had an official religion. So when people with different opinions showed up, like the Quakers, there was trouble. At first, they simply banished these people from the colony. They even fined ship's captains who brought Quakers over from England. Eventually, things escalated, and they began confiscating property, cutting off ears, or boring holes in Quakers' tongues to keep them from speaking. 
Eventually, they even used the death penalty. The most famous case, of course, being that of Mary Dyer, who was hanged here on Boston Common in 1660 for the simple crime of coming to town. The previous year, they had already walked her up to the scaffold and put the noose around her neck as a warning. So no, they really didn't get it perfect. But for that matter, you and I don't always get it perfect either, because even though we now live in this free republic, we still sometimes struggle with the idea that people should actually be free to believe whatever they want, say whatever they want, to the point where now some points of view are being forcibly removed from the public arena. But still, in spite of our fallen humanity, here we are with a constitution that guarantees a lot of things that you and I now take for granted. But back in the 17th century, when these ideas were first taking root, they were nothing but a dream. A dream that was cherished by people who had seen something better in the pages of the Bible. And some of those early settlers were much faster than others to put those new ideas into practice. Take Roger Williams, for example, a man who was expelled from the Massachusetts Bay Colony and went on to found the colony of Rhode Island, where the separation of church and state became reality. And William Penn, the devoted Quaker who had been locked up in the Tower of London for his beliefs, but then went on to create the colony of Pennsylvania, where people were free to exercise their faith, including a very interesting settlement at Ephrata that decided they would keep the seventh-day Sabbath instead of Sunday. So it might have taken time, and we might have been slow to learn, but things moved much faster here than they did over in Europe. In fact, compared to the pace of the old world, which was still beleaguered by centuries-old power struggles and hindered by complicated political considerations, these new ideas were taking root at an astonishing pace. As Victor Hugo once put it, there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And when you see all the things that had to happen to make this republic possible, well, you've got to wonder if somebody wasn't driving the process. Today, it's become popular to suggest that the reason we have religious freedom is because of the Enlightenment. The way some people tell the story, the world had been steeped in religious superstition for a very long time, and then the light of reason overthrew the superstition and finally set us free. Now, to be sure, the founders of the American Republic did consult with the ancient Greek philosophers, and they did tap into the Enlightenment, which was a good thing because they did manage to mine the very best ideas. But to suggest that America was born chiefly from secularism, that's just not true. The ideas that made this republic were born in the hearts of Christians, Christians who were open enough to study the classics, but still Christians. Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Bunyan, Milton, and countless others drew their inspiration from the Bible, and then we drew our inspiration from them. What occurred in the United States happened because Christians finally recognized in the wake of the Reformation that something had gone horribly wrong when we married church and state. They recognized that Jesus had never suggested any such thing, and they set themselves to the task of undoing the damage we caused. In the words of Jesus, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. We finally recognize that Jesus never seized the reins of power in order to make his point. We shouldn't be doing it either. The kingdom of God is built on love, not force. That's the very thing that we were trying to set straight here in America. 
Now, here's the thing that you've really got to wonder. If all of those other big empires, from Babylon to Rome and beyond, if they're all in Bible prophecy, what about the most powerful, wealthiest nation in the history of the world? Shouldn't we be able to find America in prophecy too? You might be surprised at what we find, and you might really be surprised at what the Bible says comes next.